Good morning, I'm Brian Agavino, the lead pastor at The Summit. Are you allergic to poison ivy? I bet many of you, like me, have your stories. So when I was around eight years old, I was playing in the backyard with some friends who we were playing hide and seek, and I had found the ultimate hiding spot. It was right behind this pile of wood, and there were these plants that were had grown and there were some vines that were up on the firewood and so I just crawled right in there and it was brilliant because no one ever came to find me. Well, as you might imagine, the next morning when I woke up, I had poison ivy literally everywhere. So much so that it was all over my face that my eyes had swollen shut. I could barely see through my eyes. It just barely, I would prop them open like this so I could see yelling for my mom to come and get me. We went to the doctor's office, a whole kit and caboodle. I ended up having a season of tons of calamine lotion and oatmeal baths and steroids and Benadryl and you name it, it was pumped into my body to try to make me heal. And over and over and over and over and over again, my mother would say to me those famous three words, do not scratch. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever had poison ivy, it is super, super hard not to scratch (laughs) poison ivy. I don't know that it was a win or a lose, but that was one of the most intense experiences of poison ivy that I've ever had. Today, in our series on fruition, we come to the last one in the list that Paul lays out in his letter to the Galatians on the singular fruit of the Spirit. It's in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. He says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Yes, that self-control to help me not scratch, not itch, not dig in to the things that was covering my body and just wanting it to go away. Self-control is the power struggle between what I want to do and what I ought to do. Self-control is the power struggle between what the flesh and myself wants and what the spirit wants. I mean, if we really think about it, who is the toughest person in our lives? I mean, sure, there might be moments where we would say our friends or our coworkers or our boss or our neighbors or even those moments where we might say our kids or our spouse. But deep, deep down, we know that the problem is ourselves. It's us. And and in this, we all struggle with self-control. Every single one of us struggles with self-control. And so let's just take a moment here and I would ask, where is it that you long for self-control in your life? What is it that you struggle with? Maybe it's a habit you wish was under control. Food or sex or money. Maybe it's an emotion you wish was under control. Your anger, anxiety, Loneliness. Maybe it's a relationship you wish was under control. A friend, a spouse, a neighbor, co-worker. Maybe it's your tongue that you wish was under control. Gossip or sassiness or harshness. And if you can't think of something that's out of control, then maybe it's your pride <laughs> that is out of control because we all struggle with self-control. Now, I'd like to dive into this topic of self-control and ask three questions. Why is it so hard? What is the answer? And how do we do it? Why is it so hard? What is the answer? And how do we do it? Why is it so hard? Well, the reason self-control is so hard is that we have been taught that self-control is something that comes from within. So self-control is so hard because we're taught to look at it the wrong way. Uh, You know, Nike tells us, just do it. And Nancy Reagan says, just say no. And we've got both of them telling us, this is how you're going to have self-control. You're just going to do it or you're just going to say no. And we all know it just doesn't work like that. In fact, 
I think Paul, what he says about self-control is something we can all relate to. In the book of Romans, chapter 7, verse 15, he, he says some of the most realistic explanations about walking through life and dealing with sin and struggles that, that is raw and, and super authentic. He says this, For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very things I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that is, it is good. So now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me within me. And you can see a struggle. I can relate so much to that. I, I don't do what I want to do, and I do not do what I don't want to do. There's a book called The Message. It's a translation. It's a paraphrase. It's not always the perfect one we use for Bible study, but it can be really helpful, especially in passages like this. Eugene Peterson wrote it. I want to read it to you because I think it's helpful. He wrote it this way. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more. For if I know the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decision, my decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It gets the better of me every time. I, I want so deeply, we all want so deeply to be controlled, to be under control, to be self-controlled. But we look within to do that, to either just do it or just say no, and we find ourselves failing. It's hard because what I want to do, I don't do, and what I don't want to do, I do. And then here's what else happens to make it even worse. When I try and I try and I try and then it's just not working and the desire is too great, I give in and I binge what I don't want to do. And then I find myself in more shame and more guilt and more depression and then what do I try to do? I do it all over again. All right, let's try harder this time to be self-controlled. So I try really hard not to get angry. I try really hard to be nice. And then in the depth and the heart of the emotion, no matter how hard I try, what happens? There's the explosion. I try really hard to eat good or to be healthier. And then I just need that double butter burger from Culver's with fries, with a Coke, with cheese curds, and then to top it all off with a turtle ice cream. Now, listen, you have to be really careful here because you know, God created us to enjoy the things of this life, but what happens is, is, is we, we realize that we start to take things on a level where we need some kind of control in our lives, and the way we try to control those things is we look internally to deal with them. There's a famous study, Walter Mischel, Ivy League professor, did an experiment on self-control about 50 years ago, and what he did, it's called the marshmallow experiment, he created a test to see how various five-year-olds would respond to being left alone with a marshmallow for 15 minutes with the instructions not to eat it. And with the promise that if they didn't eat it, they would be given two when time was up. And the results were exactly what you might think. Some were able to not eat and some weren't. They couldn't hold off for the 15 minutes. But here was his conclusion. This is what he found because he was really studying what was enabled or empowered the ones who weren't eating the marshmallow to achieve what they wanted to do. And he said this. He said, the children who succeeded turned their backs on the cookie, pushed it away, 
pretended that it's something non-edible like a piece of wood, or they invented a song. Instead of staring down the cookie, they transformed it into something with less of a throbbing pull on them. And here was his principle for self-control. If you change how you think about it, its impact on what you feel and do changes. Now, this is what we learn that self-control is. Basically, it's a gospel of distraction and distancing. Right? Like if, if you want to do something that you shouldn't do, then distract yourself. Like do something different. And if you or if you want a different habit, a, something in your life that you want that's good, then distract yourself from the things that are bad. And here's the problem with that. In self-control, most of the time, we are relying on ourselves to be self-controlled. And at the heart of this whole thing is the problem that our self is not controlled. And we're asking ourselves to be what controls what is out of control. Do you see the fallacy in that? The world tells us to master ourselves with ourselves. The word self-controlled in the Bible, what it means is it means power over self, mastery over yourself. And the Bible, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ has so much more to teach us than just distraction and distancing. It's one thing to resist a marshmallow for 15 minutes. It's another to have a lifetime of control of sin. Here in the context of our passage, the very power for this mastery comes not from within. You saw Paul saying, it has to come from somewhere else. It, I can't do it. The law is not, the rule in and of itself is not enough for me to stop, to have the willpower to do it, and I need help from somewhere. And the answer that the Bible offers to us, actually, and here it is in Galatians 5.23, that the fruit of the Holy Spirit in us is self-control. Yes, turn your eyes and attention, but not to a mere diversion, but to the source of true change and real power that is outside of yourself where you actually can lawfully indulge. Self-control comes when you want something or someone else more than yourself. So, so what is the answer? What is the answer to self-control in our lives? Two thoughts here. The first is this. Self-control is not inward, but upward. Self-control is not inward, but upward. We have to be moved by something outside of ourselves that can truly satisfy us, that can give us what our hearts desire, so that the things in this life can be enjoyed in the proper way. And, and so this is why we say that the answer for the, those of us who are following Jesus Christ is to say, yes, we've already seen that the answer to the needs and hopes and desires and the longings of our life is not to find it in us or even in the world, but it's to find it in God himself. And so we don't turn inward to fix ourselves. We actually turn upward. We turn towards God. We, we turn towards him and, and we indulge in a way that... We, we can only ever be satisfied because there's no way that he can be entirely consumed. Tim Keller, a pastor in New York, he wrote this, You can't get self-control by appealing to yourself. It's possible to get your habits under control, and it's possible to get your tongue under control by letting your pride get out of control. And this is, this is the point, like anytime we look internally to our own willpower, to our own strength, so, so I can, in a way, I can, I can work my body, I can discipline my body into a way where I'm like, I'm going to work out every day, I'm going to start doing these things, and then what does that say? Then I start thinking, look how good I am, look at what I've accomplished, I've done all these things, I'm great, I'm, and, or maybe it's a sin habit in my life, I, I'm not going to do these things that aren't healthy for me, or sinful things in my life, and so I'm going to, you know, stop 
indulging in TV all the time and I'm going to be more disciplined. And, and we start to think when I stop doing those things, sure, we can change our habits, but what does that do? Then it just elevates the pride in our lives. Uh, look how good we are. Look at what we've accomplished. Look, And it becomes this thing that what you can see that that pattern is only going to create more and more this concept and idea where we're giving into, over to ourselves and ourself and the flesh lead us down a path of not being self-controlled because either our habits are in control and our pride is out of control or our habits are out of control and we're just always living in this moment of being out of control. So where do we find control? Well, it's to turn our hearts to, turn our love and our affections and our desires to God himself. The answer to self-control is we have to be consumed by, moved by, drawn to someone that is outside of ourselves so that the power of self to draw us into desires or pride can therefore then be controlled. Because if we let ourselves consume to the point of what we want, in essence, we become not human then. This is the awesome principle of scripture. (laughs) You have to lose yourself to find yourself. You have to seek the love of others to find love yourself. If you want to be self-controlled, here's the principle, in a way that isn't prideful and won't lead to excess or binges, we have to be satisfied in God. And then we will find self-control. Now, what's important to add to this is a question that should be stirring in your heart. And so we then would say, okay, Brian, if I, if I need to just be satisfied in God, does this mean I just sit back and I just watch and I wait for self-control and it's just supposed to happen? Well, this brings us to our second point of how. Self-control is not passively received, but actively received. So it's a great question. How, you know, what does this look like? Well, to What I think we see in scripture is that there's this dance to self-control. It's something we receive, but it's received actively and not passively. So, So what that means is we're working in conjunction in some ways with the Holy Spirit. To, to allow him to do the work that he wants to do in our lives. So imagine that I got a new car for my birthday. Dondra had gone out and she found this really cool car and she's like, well, I'm gonna give this to Brian for his birthday. And so she wrapped it all up real cool and she put it on our driveway and she, you know, on my birthday, she takes me outside and closes my eyes and says, hey, surprise, happy birthday. And I'm like, oh man, that's amazing. And there's this beautifully wrapped gift on the driveway. And imagine I just was like, thank you so much, I love it, it's amazing, and I just let it sit there. That she gave me this gift, but I just looked at it, and that was all I did. I mean, mean, the point of that is that that would be a passive response to that, right? Or even more fully, say I did unwrap, and I was like, oh man, that's an amazing car, holy cow, wouldn't it be great to drive and so cool? And then I just let it sit in my driveway and I rode my bike to work every day and I'm like, man, this bike is pretty cool. Yeah, it does what I need it to do. It's amazing and it solves all my problems. It gets me to where I need to go. But yet I have this amazing gift in my driveway that if I were to actively receive it, that that I were to participate in it, that's when I would really get to enjoy it and experiencing something that was so much more beautiful and wonderful and majestic than just riding my bike to work every day. that's that's the difference between passive receiving and active receiving is that that we take this moment to to think about God himself who's been given to us and we actively engage we read his word we worship we commune with other believers we pray that that we that we take part in the things that have been given to us to enjoy God himself the dance, the answer to self-control is to actively receive. And what's promised as a fruit of the Holy Spirit is that when we receive the beautiful gift we have been given, he will work in a way to keep our flesh, our self, under control. Because when our hearts are satisfied in who we are in Christ, then our self can be in control. 
So the point is, we cannot do it without the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will not do it without us. So the answer to self-control is that self-control is not an inward pursuit, but an upward pursuit. And self-control is not a passively received pursuit, but an actively perceived, received pursuit. And what does that look like? How do we do it? Well, we have to start to listen and learn a new song. Hang with me here. We, we have to rehearse the song of the gospel in our heart and mind all the time. And, and God's mercies are new every day. So, so we have to learn new songs and new beauties and new majesties about who God is and what he's done and what he's accomplished and how he sees us. We have to sing these songs to our hearts over and over and over and over again. And when we're in those moments of temptation and struggle, of longing for self-control, that's when we need to sing in those songs to our hearts to remind us the truths that, that are actually not just truths that we know, but realities of our soul and lives. You know, the enemy is going to come along and say, God knows this is enjoyable. He just doesn't want you to have any fun. Or go ahead and take one more drink or one more bite or make one more purchase. It will make all your troubles go away. The enemy is going to say, go ahead and look at that image. It will make you more powerful, more desired, more aroused. Or the enemy is going to say, you deserve better. What's wrong with a little reward? And in those moments, we have to confess we don't have the power to resist. I wonder if you can just stop for just a second. Like, it's kind of the, this, this acknowledgement of, yeah, the power that my flesh is going to give in to be out of control. We have to confess that we've tried and failed. That, that the testimony of our lives is, is not victory in those areas. It, it's primarily failure. And, and so then what we do, then, then the Spirit can, can point us not to just the truths, but the real experience of God by showing us who we are in Christ. This is what we call preaching the gospel to our hearts. Spirit, show me how in Christ I have complete and utter freedom. Show me how I have complete and utter pleasure. Show me how I have complete and utter acceptance. Show me how I have a complete and beautiful inheritance. It's looking at Jesus and saying, I so want this, but I don't want anything to get in between you and me. And we're reminded over and over and over again that the wonder of the cross tells us, and this is what's so interesting about Romans chapter 7, that right after Paul talks about his struggle and his frustrations, he then says in verse, chapter 8, verse 1, there is now therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That Paul, in the midst of his battle, what he's saying is, I need to be reminded that in Christ even when I'm out of control, he has chosen to draw me into his presence because he wants something better for me. He wants what's best for me. And so even in my failures, I can come. And, and, and even in those darkest moments, I can worship and say, I can't do it, Jesus. So help, help show me who I am in you. Help show me how I'm loved. Help show me how I'm accepted. Help show me the inheritance I have. Help remind me of those things and not just truths that I know, but realities in my heart that move my soul. That's why I like using the picture of a song here. It's not just something that we know. It's a song that bursts forth from our soul where we can't help but sing. It moves us so much. There's a couple stories in Greek mythology I'll conclude with. In, in Greek mythology, there's the story of the sirens, and they were half women, half bird, and they lived on an island, and they would try to keep sailors that pass them by. Uh, they would try to entice these sailors who pass them by by singing, and they would sing these beautiful songs, and they would lure them with their singing so that their ships would run aground on the rocks and they would perish. 
So the story of Odysseus passed by the island and he knew about the sirens. And so what he did was he filled his ears with wax and he tied himself to the mast so that he could not be seduced which in and of itself is what that is, our self-will. We're like, no, I'm just gonna try so hard and do whatever I can, la, 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 la. But there's another story, as maybe not as well known. Orpheus, an Argonaut, he employed a different strategy. He took a harp and he played music of such superiority and beauty that when they passed by the sirens in their songs, the sailors gave no heed to their song because of the beauty of the song that was being heard in front of them. My friends, when our affections are taken up by the song that God is singing over us of his grace and his mercy and his goodness and his faithfulness, and his patience, and his love for you and for me. And those songs, when we allow those songs to be the songs that are sung over every day and every moment of our life, they will woo our hearts. They will be the songs that will make all the other songs have no appeal to us. And in those moments is when the Spirit can work in a way to bring love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control into our lives. When Christ is our all in all, that is when the Spirit can bear the fruit of self-control in our lives. May we today listen to and hear the song of God singing over us so that we can pass by the sirens on our journeys and be moved and self-controlled because of what we have in him. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for the spirit that you've given us, that you knew the flesh was so powerful and so strong that we wouldn't be able to, to suppress the flesh ourselves, but you've given us the spirit to to spotlight Jesus, to spotlight what he has done for us, to help us not just know it, but to actually experience what it means to be adopted as sons and daughters, to be given an inheritance, to be brought into union with Jesus. And so we pray that when we gather, when we sing these songs, that these would become the songs of our hearts. And the songs that you sing would draw us into your presence and that we would be moved to a place where we we couldn't help, we couldn't help, but allow the Spirit to show us when being in control of ourselves isn't what we need or being out of control isn't what we need, but what we need is you. And so help us today. And when we fail today, remind us that there's no condemnation and draw us back to tasting the goodness of that, of your forgiveness and your grace. And we, when we succeed, remind us that we're succeeding because of you and not because of something that we have done. So Father, may we today walk by your spirit, for your glory and your fame we pray.